Welcome to uh, the second part of this course, uh, Data Science for Geoscience, where we'll talk about uh, statistical geochemistry. So geochemical data is quite common, of course, in the geosciences, uh, as we do many types of chemical analysis, whether it's of rocks or fluids or uh, oceans. Um, and so in doing so, there are a number of uh, things we have to be aware of. First of all, much of this geochemical data is compositional in nature. That means that there is some kind of a total that's being uh, analyzed, whether it's a drug percentage or, or volumes, kilograms, etc. cetera. Uh, so there is a constant sum uh, involved in this data. And so the, the type of uh, statistical methods that we will be relying on are called compositional data analysis. Next, we'll uh, uh, cover some topics in multivariate analysis in general which brings us to uh, the second part of this, which is factor analysis. In factor analysis, we'll try to explain, essentially, the geochemical compositions by a limited number of factors. And then hopefully, we can link those factors to some actual cause uh, or process that took place that caused these uh, geochemical compositions. In compositional data analysis, we deal with data that are compositions. And there are many examples of this. It doesn't have to just be a geochemical analysis. Uh, for example, grain size distributions. Um, we know that grain size distributions, they are distributions. So they're integral. Um, some uh, integral essentially is, is, is uh, one. So that's another constant sum uh, example. Facious proportions. Um, and compositional data analysis is not just existing in the geosciences, but has many applications outside. So what we have to be aware of, as I mentioned before, is that uh, we have to be careful in applying statistical approaches that are classical and that ignore the fact that uh, the data has a constant sum. And we'll see uh, some examples where, indeed, when we do that, then we get misleading results or even uh, results that are lead to erroneous uh, conclusions. There's a lot of literature on uh, compositional data analysis, in particular those by the Barcelona group. Um, and uh, I list a, just a couple of examples here. So the book, uh, Compositional Data Analysis Theory and Applications, uh, it's nice because it has uh, a lot of examples that are useful to understand. And then, uh, then also there are a number of articles um, that we'll talk a little bit about uh, in terms of applications. I'd also like to thank the Barcelona group and in particular Vera Pavlovsky Klan, uh, who provided some of the slide material as well as some of the examples and provided really good feedback on these methods, which I think are quite important. So let's talk about two examples. One uh, is a ge they're basically two geological examples, uh, but they could serve as examples for for similar kind of studies. So. We look first at what is called the Dickinson model. The Dickinson model is essentially a model that um, was developed by Stanford uh, former students, uh, Dickinson. And he looked at uh, what are called sediment provenance studies. So in terms of, in particular, global groups of sand, sandstone composition, whether they're rich in quartz or poor in quartz or feldspar. So his argument was, of course, that sandstone uh, composition reflect the nature of the rocks in the source area. Uh, as well as uh, the path by which the, the rock uh, goes from source area to, into, into, into the basin and creates uh, that sandstone. So what he discovered was that they're based empirically on geochemical data, basically the composition of those sandstones, is that the relationship between the sandstone composition and the plate tectonic setting, whether we're dealing with a continental plate uh, setting or a magmatic arc setting, uh, that ha had uh, an influence on uh, the, the, ter the tertiary uh, composition of sandstones. And if that's indeed the case, then we can start building a model uh, where we can start uh, making predictions based on the sandstone composition about the tectonic setting. So provenance studies in general um, ask the question of where does stuff come from and how did it get there? So for those who are uh, not uh, that familiar with sedimentary geology, is a simple overview of what we mean by that. So we start with a source area, uh, area where um, the rocks erode, the weather erode, break, abrase, etc., get into uh, the sedimentary basin, uh, 
where they go possibly um, additional transformations as compactions uh, and diagenesis burial of the fluids of the of the fragments and, and, and creating the sandstone. So Dickinson um, the nomenclature, which is this one here, essentially sandstone, uh, of course, um, uh, consisting of quartz, um, feldspar, the uh, aluminum silicates, and then also some uh, lithic fragments. So basically, there are two group, three groups here uh, in the composition, and those individual groups can then be, uh, those bigger groups can be decomposed into smaller uh, groups such as the monocrystalline quartz and polycrystalline quartz, etc. And then you have the plagioclase and the alkali feldspars. So in total, uh, we would have done uh, a number of, um, of um, uh, proportions that are uh, for each of these elements, and then we can group things into what are called subcompositions. So we will represent all this data by means of uh, ternary systems, uh, so ternary diagrams. For example, I could look at quartz, feldspar, and lithic um, um, essentially composition, and I also could look at just monocrystalline quartz, uh, for example, feldspar and uh, a total lithic uh, uh, fragments. The provenance association, we're looking at uh, four, essentially. Uh, one is uh, continental block provenance, uh, magmatic arc provenance, uh, and recycled origin uh, provenance. And then we can also have a mixed uh, provenance. So here, then, we have various uh, of these uh, of these ternary diagrams, for example, here we have the QFL model, and then in within that uh, plot, you see the various uh, data points being plotted uh, in terms of their compositions. And so um, then, of course, we could look at grouping these compositions within these uh, data points, and then referring to them um, in terms of continental block recycled origin or magmatic R provenance. And we see indeed that there, uh, there are groups of chemical sig geochemical signatures that seem to point out to, uh, for example, magmatic R provenances that are different from, from the other two. So we can make many of those ternary diagrams because uh, we have here six uh, uh, elements to deal with or six groups to deal with, which then leads to a number of these, um, of these ternary diagrams. So <clears throat> First, let's look a little bit about ternary diagrams. One of the issues with ternary diagrams, here I see uh, one example of a ternary uh, diagram, is, uh, is has to do with confidence. So we, we obviously see a natural uh, dispersion of samples within, say, one particular group. And then the question is, what is the, the confidence on this particular group? Um, and here, um, if we just take some simple confidence intervals, then uh, obviously those confidence intervals would ignore the composition and therefore uh, the fact that we deal with the composition and therefore create confidence intervals that go outside of the ternary uh, diagram. So we'll see later that um, a way to deal with that is indeed by looking at log ratios. Uh, and these are a way of analyzing uh, compositions. Uh, for example, here you see the, let me put on my pointer, here we see the, the ratio of, uh, for example, feldspar over the rest, quartz over the rest, uh, and uh, we get a nice uh, linear relationship, while here, obviously, that relationship was not linear. So one of the things we'll, we'll discuss later is how we can transform this um, data that's in a ternary diagram into a diagram where it can do more sort of classical statistical analysis. You could imagine that indeed here I can model relatively easily, uh, say, the confidence interval or a density function uh, that can then be mapped back into uh, this diagram. So the question that we will address later is, how does the Dickinson model perform, but then quantitatively? So far, uh, based on the ternary diagrams, we have been grouping our samples, um, but more in a qualitative sense. So is there a way to actually, say, perform discriminant analysis uh, using creating discriminant function that can um, group our samples into distinguished uh, group, but then based on a statistical method of grouping rather than just a qualitative method of grouping?
and can we associate then a measure of confidence with these results? Another example that you'll find in the book is um, in that uh, compositional data analysis book um, has to do with, uh, again, log ratio analysis and geochemical discrimination of limestones. So here the authors are interested in uh, doing a stratigraphic little stratigraphic correlation. And the way they would like to do that is by looking at the chemical composition of limestones and see whether there are certain signatures of these chemical compositions that allow us to do this kind of uh, correlation. So that's what is uh, said here. Um, and again, we'd like to uh, achieve this by doing a quantitative uh, uh, assessment uh, based on, on some statistical modeling, again, rather than sort of looking at it from a much more qualitative uh, point of view. Again, if we would do a classical um, analysis of these uh, limestones and their chemical composition, and we look at, for example, iron oxide versus magnesium oxide, then um, we notice there's not much uh, discrimination uh, that we can make out. And that's typically what we'd like to get, of course, is by looking at elements that are correlated or uh, elements in a composition that are uh, correlating uh, that may indicate uh, a certain type of limestones, with, which then uh, allows us to do this, uh, this stratigraphic correlation. So again, if we look at um, as, uh, at a log ratio um, plot where we plot the log ratio of, of iron oxides versus calcium oxide and magnesium oxide versus calcium oxide log ratio, suddenly we see a much more clearer picture in terms of uh, grouping of, of, of particular limestones, which allows us then to do this kind of stratigraphic correlation much easier than, say, based on the simple uh, classical methods. Okay, so now we have uh, seen a few examples. Uh, so we'll provide first um, a general introduction to compositional data analysis. So in this general introduction, we just outlined some problems. We formulate the problem uh, properly, and we'll try to introduce a space or some uh, within which we will be working with compositional data. We'll not essentially um, explain to you here what that exactly that space is, but what properties that space should have in order for us to do a meaningful uh, and unambiguous analysis. So what can go wrong? Let's have an example here where we have two scientists that record composition of soils in soils. And so one scientist um, looks at uh, four things in that soil, animal, vegetable, mineral, water, and looks at that composition, while the other scientist looks exactly the same samples but only looks at animal, vegetable, and mineral and does not look uh, at water because uh, of drying of the samples. So we assume that, say, those two are, are, are completely accurate. So if indeed I would be uh, collecting a number of samples and then look at the composition, say, for example, um, I get these, uh, these two, two uh, different sample sets, where, where this, as you notice, is simply the reweighing uh, of that. So, for example, I have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So, if I, if I want to look at the subcomposition, I get, of course, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Let's now look at correlations. So, what's the correlations uh, that are existing between the various uh, sub subcompositions? Does vegetable correlate with mineral? Does animal correlate with water, etc.? So, if I look at the correlation of uh, created by um, say the first scientist, and I see, for example, correlation between uh, x1 and x2, that's positive, and between x1 and x4, that's negative. If I now look at the correlation that is created by the exact same samples, uh, but only looking at a subcomposition, then we notice that the Pearson correlation coefficient seems to be changing. For example, between x1 and x2, now I have a, a negative uh, correlation instead of here a positive correlation. Uh, for example, between X2 and X3, I had a negative correlation of 0 0.87, and now I have a negative correlation of 0 0.79. Knowing that these are exact same samples, uh, and knowing that what I eventually would like to understand of this data set 
is the correlation between the various elements uh, in terms of their geochemical composition, then obviously this is a very undesirable uh, undesired result uh, because correlations seem to be depending on what subcompositions that I'm studying. So why, why is this occurring? Well, this was uh, developed by Aitchison. Uh, John Aitchison was the person in 1986 who um, basically wrote the book on, on compositional data analysis and, uh, and, and how to deal with such uh, data. So th the problem, of course, lies in the fact that uh, we're dealing with a constant sum. Uh, so here, let's say we have a problem where the sum uh, between the various uh, is our proportions. So like, just like in the previous example, and it sums up to 100%. It doesn't have to be 100%. It could be any kind of constant sum. So if I look at the covariance, for example, uh, between the first uh, composition and uh, the first uh, element and the entire composition, and assuming that this covariance is zero, then I can calculate from that uh, essentially by decomposition here that the sum of these various covariances between the first element and the other elements it turns out to be negative, negative variance. So what that means essentially is that uh, on the, that we here have a sort of a negative bias that's included directly into analyzing uh, the covariance uh, of these uh, various uh, elements, even though that there may not be at all any uh, covariance between them. And so that has to do again with this uh, constant sum. It also means that that these covariances uh, don't have free range. I can have a covariance between x1 and x2 and x1 and xd that are sort of independent from each other. It's, there's always uh, a, a negative bias that's included in, in, in studying that. And that has an enormous impact on the kind of results uh, that we get. So the first message is that uh, in order to calculate with uh, compositions, we should not calculate directly uh, with the individual elements that are in this uh, composition. So what does that mean? It essentially means uh, that we need to create a different space. So what do we mean by space? So we are used to what is called the Euclidean space. And in Euclidean space, uh, we're dealing with vectors. For example, a composition can be seen as a vector. And so, but we're used to in this space to deal with vectors that we can add, multiply without any restrictions. Uh, and that, that's the property of that particular space. The problem in applying the, the classical Euclidean geometry and the classical algebra is that it's not a proper space or geometry for compositional data because once you start adding and multiplying, I may end up with something that does not fall almost uh, anymore on the simplex. So the simplex is that uh, area which is defined by that constant sum. We'll, we'll talk about that in the next uh, um, in the next slide. The other thing is that differences are not always reasonable. So, for example, if I take a difference between 0 0.1 and 0 0.05, that's the same as the difference between 50 and 50.1. 50.05 and 50.1. And of course, in uh, this is a doubling uh, of the amount and this is just a small uh, increase that could be even uh, within the sample error. Okay, let's put some basic concepts into notation. So a composition consists of various parts, uh, part one till part D. Uh, and so a composition is a vector. Um, we'll have, uh, let me put on my pointer, we have that each of the xi within the composition is positive. Um, you can ask, well, that's not always the case because we're going to, of course, have zeros. And so zeros, uh, we'll have to treat uh, separately. We'll see that later. It leads to some uh, problems in terms of the composition. What's very important about compositions is that they only carry relative information, right? So they have a constant sum, the absolute value uh, of x1 uh, on its own um, it uh, doesn't carry information, it's only the relative changes that are existing between these uh, parts. And so we'll talk about that uh, with an example in a bit. So this sample space is called a simplex. Uh, for example, in, uh, in 3D, you would have a triangle, in 4D, tetrahedron, etc., for within which uh, that uh, the samples can exist. Uh, a closure um, is essentially an, an operation. It's a projection where we take our samples and we calculate 
uh, a projection uh, of that sample such that um, you could say everything is now calculated in terms of percentages rather than in terms of absolute values. For example, if I take the sample here, 53, 76, 14, or I take the sample 28, 41, 8, notice that the, the values are very, very different. So uh, the only information that I have would be that they can both be projected onto the same uh, percentage, 37, 53, and 20. And that would then be the closure operation on a sample um, on the composition X. And so both of these compositions give you the same closure. We have then also subcompositions. So instead of looking at the entire composition and all the parts, I'm only looking at uh, subcompositions. And so then we can calculate the closure uh, for those uh, subcompositions by doing this uh, standardization that's given here. So an example of a uh, of plotting a subcomposition would be a ternary diagram. Um, and so, for example, if I have many, uh, if I have a composition consists of many elements, I can plot uh, these ternary diagrams uh, that give me an idea of uh, of the uh, subcomposition. Here's an example of such ternary diagram where we see um, uh, three parts um, and we get uh, a set of data points that are plotting within this ternary uh, diagram. Um, so I think you're all familiar with uh, reading off ternary diagram um, and uh, it's quite simple. For example, here, if I have A, B and C, then of course the uh, the A, the, the part A, the say, for example, if A would be 10%, then uh, the way that works is that I'd look at a line that is parallel to the CB uh, that would be then 10% uh, on this portion of the triangle, which would be over here. Uh, for uh, B, I get, uh, sorry, for C, I get 0 0.5, and for B, I get 0 0.4. Again, by looking at the parallel lines, for B, it would be AC, and for C, it would be AB. And so that would be then a, a subcomposition here of that particular uh, data point. Okay, so let's first discuss some broad principles that we'd like to get. So the first thing, of course, we uh, will have to worry about is what is called scale invariance. And scale invariance means that the analysis that, again, it reflects the fact that your data is not reflecting anything absolute, but only relative uh, information is in that compositional data, no absolute information. And so that also means that regardless of how we define the closure constant, whether I add up to 100% or I, I add up to one kilogram, uh, the analysis uh, should not change. It should not depend on that uh, particular uh, scaling. The second uh, principle, which is logical, is that there should be permutation invariance. That whether I, in my vector, I arrange things in one way or another way, that again, the analysis should not be any different. There should also be what is called subconscious coherence. That's um, the first example that I showed you. If you are doing your analysis with four parts versus say three parts, then uh, that should not contradict each other. Uh, or in general, if I look at the full composition versus any subcomposition, your analysis should not be in contradiction. The notion of scale invariance is quite important in compositional data analysis. As you mentioned before, composition really only carry relative information. I do not calculate the values that we have, the parts that we have in that composition are not, should not be interpreted as absolute. Just to illustrate that, here's a small example. Suppose we have two uh, kinds of sandstones, a parent sandstone and a daughter sandstone. So one is say older than, uh, than the other one. And suppose that we have looking at sands derived from both of them. And suppose that we have these two compositions here in terms of the sands. We have quartz, feldsprachs, and rock fragments. And so the first would have a composition of 53, 41, and 6. And the second one would have a composition of 37, 53, and 10. The question now is, what what is this change, this change here due to? And so uh, it may be tempting to to interpret that there is a decrease in quartz and an increase in feldspar and an increase in rock fragments. But that would be um, misleading because there are actually many uh, explanations. For example, I could also say that, that Q has absolutely no change and that the change in Q that we see here is just to the compositional change in feldspar. 
namely that we were added in, uh, essentially uh, more feldspar to the samples and more rock fragments, and therefore the compositional change is just to the uh, the closure. Similarly, we could say that there's no change in F, so that means per 100 gram sandstone I could have added 25 uh, decreased 25 uh, grams of quartz and added uh, a little bit of these rock fragments, and I would still get the same changes in terms of percentage. So any of these combinations um, of these extreme combinations can be used. So, so clearly uh, making us a, 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 a conclusion that sandstone has increased in terms of actual volume uh, and uh, or has decreased in terms of actual volume cannot be distinguished from this uh, simple proportional example. So we cannot really uh, make any conclusions as, as so far as volumes or, or, or masses that are subtracted for that we would have to know more have to have more information we have to actually know the actual uh, totals uh, in terms of say grams for each of those samples so this is sort of depicted mathematically here um, so imagine that we have um, composition data in r3 like the example that we had with uh, quartz uh, um, yeah this is a different case here um, it's no longer quartz, but say QPF and A is original sandstone. So, for example, um, if A is original sandstone, then you can see a composition as a vector in a vectorial space. And so if you're looking at the closure form, then essentially we are looking at the, the upper octant here that uh, contains this triangle, which is which is our, our, our ternary diagram. So any you notice you would notice that any uh, composition, if I say a change from A to B, can be A to B in terms of this ternary diagram, but you can also have any other uh, compositional change that is along this uh, vector because everything in the end due to the closure form gets mapped into this ternary diagram. So Q and F would give the same result B. And ob obviously uh, the composition of Q and the composition of F, F is very different say than from B. So Therefore, we say that two vectors are compositionally equivalent uh, if their closure is the same and they lie uh, along a line. That's basically saying the closure is essentially a projection of a point onto this, uh, uh, onto this triangle. And so what we've been looking for is for functions that are scale invariant. So functions such that, of course, if I take uh, uh, multiply a composition with f uh, with a uh, vector lambda, then uh, that function would be invariant and obviously an example would be the ratios and uh, log ratios the question therefore is now what is a proper geometry so just like in our euclidean geometries where we adding and, and subtracting and multiplying and dividing we have to uh, first define basic operations and so uh, one basic operation would be a perturbation. So the question, the, the point of this perturbation is that we develop something that's the equivalent of summing in the Euclidean space. And so the symbol we use here is slightly different than in sum, just to make a differentiation between a summing composition and summing vectors. And we saw that summing vectors or the use of the vector sum um, becomes difficult to apply with compositions. And so uh, the vector sum here is defined essentially as this uh, closure of this uh, product here. And what that essentially does, and here's an example of that, suppose we have an initial composition, that's these, uh, these um, points here. Um, we'd like to perturb that composition, say by, uh, let's say by adding certain uh, uh, constant uh, com other vectors. So we'd like to perturb this composition x with this uh, vector p and so um, so that is what is done here and this would be then uh, the result of that perturbation so we go from this composition uh, into this composition here we also need to have something that's uh, powering that means uh, something that's a multiplication uh, so what if i multiply uh, a composition by a constant so the equivalent of that is to take essentially the power so here the product was a sum and so here the power becomes a product and so the closure of this power of the parts would then be the uh, an equivalent of multiplication and here uh, we see an example of that uh, again we have the uh, 
the, the uh, circles uh, get multiplied by 0 0.2 and that results in a new composition, uh, which is the composition uh, represented by the stars. So you could wonder why is this needed, this uh, new uh, geometry and these new operations. For example, in perturbation, uh, we'd, uh, that would apply to a case, say, where we would like to model change in the composition, the change that is uh, induced by certain processes. For example, metamorphic processes changes uh, the mineral composition. Um, if you talk about biology, then survival is something that will change the composition of a population. And so to, to, to model that change, we need to have an operator that can uh, represent that. Another example would be uh, sampling errors in a composition. So that this, this perturbation uh, mechanism allows us to to deal with uh, these kind of uh, sampling errors in a natural fashion. Power, um, that really applies to a case where we have multiplicative relationship. For example, if I measure grain sizes, then typically I would use uh, sieves to separate them. And then I'd like to know uh, what is the, the weight of, of each of those categories. And I would like to link that, for example, to volume. So there we have this typical multiplicative uh, relationship that in terms of a uh, composition is expressed through this power. So let me put on my uh, laser pointer. Um, so here we notice then that um, we can create a new Euclidean space. And here we already look a little bit forward to the next slide set where we talk about log ratios. For example, we'll define an inner product no longer as a, uh, a sum x i y i, uh, but now we'll um, express that through these log ratios. We'll define uh, a norm, uh, which is the length of a vector. Again, we'd, we're not using a classical definition, but we'll, using a, a, we'll be using a very different definition. Same with distance. Uh, we notice here that the distance is not calculating as a mean square difference uh, between the coordinates, but a mean square difference in terms of the log ratios. And so this is then uh, known as the HSN uh, geometry on the simplex. So we can do these calculations now. We have defined inner products, norm, and distances, and we can apply our regular uh, calculus tool. So properties of this space, um, and it sort of makes sense. Uh, for example, if I take a distance, I have a composition X and a composition Y, and I make essentially a perturbation to each of these compositions, and we'd like, of course, that the distance is not changed. Just like in Euclidean space, when you add a constant vector uh, to vector x and y, we would not expect uh, we would not expect, of course, that the distance would be changed. Uh, we can also um, define what are called compositional lines. These are basically now lines. So you, if you think about this x zero plus alpha times x, then I can uh, create a compositional line with x0 as the starting point and x is the leading vector. Um, sim similar, we can define orthogonal lines uh, simply by looking now at the inner product, um, etc. parallel lines. So what this does in the ternary diagrams is that it creates these various uh, geometries, uh, compositional lines, orthogonal lines, um, are then now expressed through these uh, various uh, geometries and so they they naturally uh, occur and particularly this uh, relates to the log ratio definition. Similarly, um, ellipses and um, shifted segments, uh, ellipses becomes these uh, ellipses in the coordinate space will become these uh, sort of rear shapes, uh, but each each one of them would be an ellipsoid in the uh, in the geometry that we have. So the advantage of working with a space is that uh, once we have a proper geometry is we can have defined orthogonality so we can use orthogonal bases that we know that can be constructed in such space. And so in such space, then if once you have an orthogonal basis, you can also create coordinates, uh, projections that lead into coordinates. And so here is a projection uh, where I have a composition X that's projected through the inner product uh, on these uh, unit on these vectors here um, that we've defined as being orthogonal basis, and we can also reconstruct. So we can express a composition uh, by means. So here we see a translation or uh, sorry projection of a composition onto its coordinates. Uh, 
So that basically assigns to each composition a coordinates. And we can then also go inverse. That means once we have coordinates, uh, we can reconstruct uh, the composition and that would simply be by this operation. So this operation looks very similar to uh, an operation you would have in Euclidean space, except now that this is a, uh, this is essentially a, a product. So this is the perturbation or a sum, and this is um, and this is the product here as defined before. So basically, um, if you're a little confused by all this, um, think about this as simply uh, Cartesian space, uh, Cartesian space where we have an axis that is orthogonal, where we have a vector within which we can express. Uh, that vector in terms of coordinates in that or a space and once we have um, the coordinate that space you can reconstruct simply back to vector and so this is now all the same except that the operations um, have now been uh, rearranged in perturbations multiplications and uh, the functions being used these log ratio functions and so that's all we'll talk about then in the next uh, section is do a little bit more talk a little bit more about these log ratios so in summary, I think uh, it's been clear from this presentation that many problems in geochemistry and elsewhere, of course, uh, involve compositions. And that um, if you just work with the parts by themselves, uh, then you run into the problem of disclosure problem, where um, naturally there's a negative bias in the correlation due to disclosure problem. And so we cannot work with the parts themselves. We have worked with other uh, functions. And log ratio functions is an example that we'll develop in, in the next section. So by doing that, or the idea of, of doing this properly, would be create a new geometry, which is called the, uh, in this case, the agent sum geometry, which is its own norm and distance uh, and inner product within which we can then do proper calculations.